The following alert is from the AARP Fraud Watch Network. Attention listeners, did you know that con artists are using jury duty to scam people? Here's how it's done. A con artist posing as a court official will call to say, you failed to report for jury duty and there's a warrant for your arrest. If you say you never received a jury notice, they'll ask for your personal information, including your social security number. Then they'll say that you can only avoid jail time if you pay a fine, either by credit card, prepaid debit card, or wire transfer. Then they've got you. So, if you get a threatening call, hang up. Legitimate jury notices are only delivered by U.S. mail. And jury duty assignments are based on voter registration or property records, not your social security number. To see con artists explain their tricks, get scam prevention tips from law enforcement, and more alerts like this one, visit aarp.org slash fraudwatchnetwork. That's aarp.org slash fraudwatchnetwork. Paid for by AARP. The opinions expressed during this program are solely the opinions of the hosts, guests, and callers. They do not necessarily represent the views of the advertisers, management, staff, or ownership of WCTC. This is WCTC's Sound Advice, the local one-hour program designed to give you the knowledge, information, and guidance to help you make better decisions in your personal and professional lives. Now, WCTC's Sound Advice. And happy Monday, Central Jersey. Welcome to another episode of Your Life at 50 Plus presented by AARP. Happy Tax Day. This is a good day for everyone, right? What better topic to talk about on tax day than finances? I'm sure that you want to talk more about money, but this time we're talking not about paying the IRS, but actually keeping more of it in your pocket and ensuring that you have enough of it when you retire. Uh, Joined in studio today by a couple guests. Uh, I have uh, Julie Marte, Associate State Director for Multicultural Outreach here at AARP New Jersey. Julie, hello. Hi, Jeff, and hi, everyone who's listening on this evening. And we will be joined shortly also by Pablo Bianchi, who's a certified financial planner. Uh, He'll be joining us after the first break, but feel free to get in queue for questions. If you want to know about how to have more money for retirement or anything else related to finances, dial in 732-545-9282 or 1-888-545-9282. And as always, we are joined today by our illustrious state president, Dave Molin. Uh, Dave's joining us on the line right now. Dave, how are you this evening? I'm good. How are you? I'm excellent. I'm excellent. Thanks for joining us, us this evening. Um, you know, it's my mind is uh, somewhat confluxed right now because it's tax day, but the weather's beautiful. I don't know whether to be happy or, or crying. <laughs> well, the, the, the good news about tax day is the day after. Whatever it is, it's all over, Jeff. Depends on how much you owed, I suppose. I guess. <laughs> So, Dave, today, one of the big topics we're going to be talking about is, um, you know, saving for retirement, making sure that you have enough money put away uh, after you retire. Um, Now, I'm going to ask a question that I hear a lot. Why is saving for retirement such a big issue for AARP, uh, since a lot of people think that the organization is for for folks who are already retired? Yeah, uh, Jeff, I'm really glad we get to talk about that because uh, I I know that you're right. A lot of people think this is old people. This is people who are already retired. Well, it's not. Uh, Let's make sure we get that to everybody. Um, AARP membership officially starts at 50. Now, why do I say officially? Well, my daughter was 44 when she joined AARP. You say, well, how did that happen? Well, there's some things people should know about AARP membership they may not know. AARP membership is not by the individual. It's by the household. So when you join AARP, your spouse is automatically a member. And when my son-in-law was 50, he joined AARP, and that made my daughter a member, and she was 44. So AARP members are, many of them are a lot younger than we think, and certainly uh, everybody, I hope, knows that uh, nobody on earth is going to escape uh, getting that AARP envelope when you're 50. Um, we are uh, focused on helping people age with dignity. Uh, that doesn't mean they're aged when we start helping them, because as I'm sure everybody is going to learn a lot about tonight, financial planning doesn't work if you're doing it for retirement if you start six months before you retire. It's got to start a lot earlier than that. And if we're going to help people retire successfully, we've got to help them earlier than that. 
Now, here's a question, another question I get often. Um, people say, well, Social Security, I'm working. They take it out every paycheck. I thought the whole point was I was going to live on that. Wasn't, isn't that enough? So what, what's your answer to that? L- let, me, let me give you some numbers on that, Jeff. Um, I, I think that's a very, very important thing for people to help motivate them to save. Social Security, number one, was never meant to be the total retirement income. Uh, total retirement income, the original concept was Social Security plus pension from an employer plus savings, a three-legged stool. Well, if anything, today, savings is more important because more and more people uh, are working in situations that don't have a pension. Uh, so let me give you some very specific numbers. Uh, about a quarter of married couples and about a half of unmarried people rely on Social Security for at least 90% of their retirement income. And how much is that income? Well, the average Social Security benefit in 2012 was just over $15,000 a year. To give you an idea of how, uh, how inadequate that is, in 2015, uh, the poverty level for an individual in the United States was just under 12000 So Social Security is very important, and I can tell you that it's important to my wife and me, um, but you can't depend on it to be what you need in retirement. And as I said earlier, and I don't think we can emphasize this enough tonight, and I'm sure Pablo will and Julie will, and that is that uh, in order to fix this problem, you've really got to start saving as early as possible. And speaking of Julie, Julie Marte, uh, AS, the uh, Associate State Director for Outreach with ARP New Jersey, I'm going to loop you in here. What is AARP doing now? What kind of resources is AARP providing when it comes to trying to ensure financial security for its members and, and all residents? Yes. Well, and as Dave and uh, you've underscored, this is such an important issue because we really need to work now to better prepare for our future, not just for us, but our families. And so starting younger is always better. Planning ahead is always better. And ARP works to promote financial literacy in all communities, including diverse communities. Um, and we've been fortunate to work with Pablo in presenting community events where we're engaging audiences or members and residents in different communities in New Jersey about planning for your future, breaking that down, what does that mean, and then also connecting resources. And ARP has a wealth of information, um, especially on Online, if you're not able to come to some of these workshops that we've held, um, where it ensures that you are connected to tools that you need to take charge of your future by offering free and unbiased information as you work, plan and save for the real possibility of long-term financial security. And um, if you have a pen ready, some of these sites that you can turn to, and we'll be sharing this throughout the program, um, both to get publications on tip sheets for financial planning and security, you can go to www. AARP.org slash order financial pubs. And these are publications that are available for free and also available in Spanish at www.aarp.org slash publicaciones financieras for any listeners who are bilingual or who want to connect this information with their bilingual members and family. Um, but really great information on the .org, ARP.org webpage um, where you can really, you know, depending what your situation is that you're looking into, whether budgeting or saving or planning ahead for retirement, um, it really walks you through a lot of information there because this is a very important topic for AARP, for not just our members, for the community so that we're all better prepared for future. And just to also provide some additional stats, um, in the U.S., one in every six seniors live in poverty. And that's a really astonishing number to think here in the United States that that many folks who are retiring um, are living in poverty. And also to break it down a little bit more, uh, the average working family has $3,000 in their retirement savings. Um, you know, so these are critical factual numbers to look at um, and what the current realities are. And this is why we do segments and workshops and work with certified financial planners. And we've been very lucky to be working with uh, Pablo Bianchi, who is on the program and we'll be sharing a lot more information soon um, to really connect the audiences with resources that can better empower them, their families, and help them to better prepare for the future. So we definitely 
definitely want to encourage the listeners who are hearing on to call on to the program as you're hearing information and definitely to tap into this wonderful resource that we have um, with having a certified financial planner that will be able to answer any questions you have about your thoughts as you're thinking ahead and for the future on what you can be doing today and right now to better prepare for your future and your families. And I'll tell you, Dave, it does seem that um, it's clearly a theme of a lot of the work that AARP is involved in these days is, is ensuring financial stability, solvency for folks when they retired. I know that this also sort of ties into the Take a Stand campaign. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the Take a Stand campaign, everybody should know about that. Uh, AARP thought a long time about this and decided that what we need in the 2016 campaign is to find out where our presidential candidates stand on protecting the long-term solvency and viability of Social Security. Uh, Rather than tell them what we think and and try to force them into something that we think, uh, we are doing a huge amount of work today uh, trying to get them to take a stand and tell us where they stand. And, in fact, most of the candidates have already done that uh, so that we know what their plans are. We can publish them. Uh, They publish them on their websites, and that's what's going to enable us to protect Social Security, because Social Security, if nothing is done, in fact, uh, uh, future beneficiaries are going to get significantly less money, Uh, something like uh, $10,000 a year uh, for a a typical um, recipient. And that's a lot of money that we don't think people can afford, and we want to help people um, uh, protect their their future. So we're doing that by working with the presidential candidates. Dave Mullen, state president of AERP New Jersey, thank you. Uh, Folks, 732-545-9282, 888-545-9282. We will be back after a short break with certified financial planner Pablo Bianchi. The following alert is from the AARP Fraud Watch Network. Attention listeners, did you know that con artists are posing as Federal Trade Commission workers and calling people about the Do Not Call registry? Here's how they do it. The scammers call and ask you to enroll, confirm, or renew your phone number on the registry in order to limit telemarketing calls. Some try to steal your personal information by asking you for your name, address, and social security number, while others just try to charge you a fee to join. Either way, Hang up the phone. The Do Not Call Registry is a free service and does not require personal information, such as Social Security number to join. These scammers are just trying to collect your personal information so they can access your bank account and steal your identity. To learn how to protect yourself from ID theft and scams like this one, visit aarp.org slash broadwatch network for tips from law enforcement and more alerts. That's aarp.org slash broadwatch network. Paid for by AARP. Now, more sound advice on WCTC and WCTCAM.com. And we're back with Your Life at 50 Plus, presented by AARP. Joining us in the studio now, Pablo Bianchi, certified financial planner. Pablo, thanks so much for coming in this evening. Good evening to everyone. Thank you for having me here. So something tells me that making sure that we have enough money to live in retirement is uh, an issue that you hear a lot about. It is a, <laughs> excuse me, uh, it is a big issue in the sense that most individuals today have not prepared themselves to the extent that they should. Um, and one of the biggest risks that we face out there is not necessarily not having enough money, is fighting longevity. Longevity is something that we have done and protected ourselves by eating well, by exercising. But that in itself, once we retire, puts us in a situation where now we have many, many years that you don't have to support yourselves. And as I was listening to you earlier, Social Security is not meant to be the main source of retirement for every American out there. It's just a portion of what we need. Mm -hmm. Now, financial planning is a term that I think a lot of people hear and they think, oh, that's for, for wealthy people who have a lot of money to make sure they store away properly. But it's not really. It's something that absolutely everybody of any income needs to be aware of. And in some cases, folks who maybe have lower incomes, maybe it's even more important to think ahead. It is an intimidating word for so many people, but I, I want to make sure that people understand that it is not. Really, all financial planning does is, is it affords you the ability to take an inventory 
of where you are today and to match that against your objectives and goals in the future. And it helps you understand how far away you are from those goals and objectives and what needs to perhaps be done. So if you want to make it simple, is a way for you to try to understand where you're going to be down the road and to see perhaps what are some of the risks and perils that you will face and prepare yourself. I think that's the part that's most scary for everyone, that they feel that, well, I am so far away that you know, to the goals and objectives. But unfortunately, what I have to tell you is that if you allow time to creep up to that date of which you need a financial plan to take place or to come into effect, like anything, the longer you wait, the less options you're going to have. Right. And I think that that there was a commercial on TV recently that that this reminds me of where they showed a very dominoes, very small domino and everyone got bigger. I mean, when you start earlier, it's probably less painful and uh, you sort of Build on itself. Indeed. And, and you know, the, the thing, the word I want to emphasize is, is, is choices. And I want to emphasize the letter S. When you start at an early age, you have choices. As you get older, that word can be minimized to choice. And then no one wants to live in a world where you don't have choices and you're just pretty much put into a one decision because really the whole idea about retirement is about living. Mm-hmm. It's not about surviving. Mm-hmm. Right. And Pablo, to to that point, um, thinking, looking ahead, you know, it's so hard. I mean, in in the culture we live in, everything is about right now and today and the bills and how challenging it is and how expensive it is to pay a mortgage, to keep up with the bills. And then so thinking about being able to put more aside or some aside to plan for the future, sometimes, you know, people get stuck on that and maybe that's a roadblock. So what are some things that people could just, you know, think about in in that situation where you're thinking, well, you know, money's tight. I can't really see how I can put aside more money. Um, some things, to, steps to look at at today. What are some things I could consider in my situation that can make some difference? So whether I am doing work on a pro bono basis, which I do quite a bit of it, or I'm dealing with uh, one of my prototypical clients, which may be someone with a net worth of a million dollars in North, You know, it's interesting, the formula is the same. And the formula all begins by understanding exactly what are your expenditures and what is it that you are bringing into your household. And I think we tend to ignore this, as simplistic as it is. And and I'm saying to you that whether you're making 20,000 a year or you're making a million dollars a year, you have to understand how much money goes out and how much money comes in. And then that affords you the ability to understand if any, you have any kind of discretionary spending. Now, if you don't have any kind of discretionary spending, you need to understand specifically where your money is going. In order to understand where your money is going, you need to understand where you're spending your money. Are you spending too much money, per se, not to pick on women at the hair salon? Are you, if we're talking about a man, uh, too much money in sporting events or any other source of discretionary spending. Are you aware, first and foremost, where your money's being spent? So the first step is to understand that we cannot live our lives to the capacity of the income that we live and we earn. So if we earn 10000 a year, we cannot be spending $10,000 exactly or $10,000 and $50, which is what a lot of people do, spend more than what they receive. That's the first step to begin to correct and to begin to take control of your future. The next step is that once you determine that is to begin to set aside money first for your future, small percentage, especially if you're younger. If you are able to do that and that becomes part of your habit, part of what you do for a living, then it really doesn't it, – it's just something common. It's something normal. No different than you're paying your, your rent or paying your car payment or your car insurance. It just becomes part of your life. Mm-hmm. But what happens is that one day in the future, you're going to wake up and you're going to see a nice pile of money. And even if it was – five hours or ten dollars that you're saving on a weekly basis and you're 25 years old or you're 30 years old by the time you get to an accelerated age of 50 55 60 you're going to find yourself in a situation there's going to be a sizable amount of money for two basic factors compound interest which is one of the most powerful forces that we deal with in the in the world right now and, and it's extremely powerful i mean just look at a mortgage 
if you sign a mortgage paper, anyone out there who signed a mortgage, they may have signed a mortgage where the loan was for $100,000. But the final payment, when it shows the cumulative payments altogether, may show that you have paid $225,000. Well, that's compound interest, but in the reverse way. Mm-hmm. We want to make sure we reverse that to our benefit as compared to the mortgage company. Right. So those are just very little steps. To, just to make it simple, we need to understand where we spend our money and take control of our expenditures. Not to tell you that you should sacrifice everything that you like, but just live within the means of what you can do. Right. So maybe one less trip to the salon and putting that to our savings or maybe Dunkin' Donuts, cutting that down. Yeah, absolutely. Correct. As compared to perhaps the other high-end coffee company and just, you know, it's or just even better, make the coffee at home. Yeah, you know, just just walk to work with a nice cup of coffee that you made that is going to cost you one-fifth. And as you drive to those stores, smile and wave and look at your – feel your pocket because you still have the money there. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good, good. point. I, I think a long time ago people would do studies uh, how much you would save if you stopped smoking, stopped buying cigarettes. They should do a similar study. How much money could a, an average person save if they, instead of buying the five dollar double mocha latte, whatever, at Starbucks, if instead they make their own coffee at home? You probably is pretty penny. Huge. I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't have a specific numbers, but I know that if I go to the popular store, it's probably going to cost me for a coffee with cream and. and uh, probably like two dollars to two dollars and fifty cents. I know that um, I could probably buy coffee at a store, let's say at a supermarket for fifteen dollars, and that probably will get me what sixty, seventy cups. Mm-hmm. It's just simple mathematics there, right? I mean, you're talking about $160 compared to $20 out of pocket. I mean, that's a lot of money. And see, those little things are the ones that on a long-term basis have a huge, huge impact. And that's the part that we get caught when we say financial planning. Well, that's just such a big conceptual word. No, no, it starts with little Mm -hmm. little steps that make a big difference Mm -hmm. long-term. There's Absolutely. a lot of little things that we could be changing that could definitely amount to a big Indeed. impact. Indeed. And you know what else What happens when you're able to do that? Then you're able to take advantage of benefits out there that they give you free money. Hold that thought, Pablo. We have to go to a break in a moment. Uh, 732-545-9282. Folks, give us a call. And uh, after this short break, we will take your calls. The following alert is from the AARP Fraud Watch Network. Attention listeners, did you know that telephone con artists are posing as FDIC representatives and making fake debt collection calls? Here's how they do it. The scammers call and say that you're delinquent on a loan and that you need to pay immediately in order to avoid lawsuit or possible arrest. Some scammers will even have your personal information and they'll use it to try and convince you that they're legitimate. But what these con artists really want is your money, wire transfers, bank account, and credit card information. Here's how to protect yourself. Do not provide or confirm any of this information over the phone. Ask that written documentation of any alleged debt be mailed to you. Legitimate creditors are required to do so. To see real con artists explain their tricks, get scam prevention tips from law enforcement, and more alerts like this one, visit aarp.org slash fraudwatchnetwork. That's aarp.org slash fraudwatchnetwork. Paid for by AARP. Now, more sound advice on WCTC and WCTCAM.com. We're back with your Life at 50 Plus presented by AARP. And we're back with Pablo Bianchi, Certified Financial Planner, and Julie Marte of AARP New Jersey. And we have a caller, Chloe from Trenton. Chloe, go ahead with your question. Okay. uh, Thank you for taking my call, Pablo. Um, I want to thank you for this presentation. But following on on everything that you've been saying about watching your expenditures, let's Let's say that I stop buying lattes every day, and now I have this discretionary income of, oh, say about $100 every month. So the next thing that I should be doing then, right, if I'm very serious about saving for my future, is I should be investing in an IRA, whether it's traditional or Roth. But 
what I'm wondering is if you can impress upon your listeners how important it is to invest in a fund that has a low expense ratio. Otherwise, all your hard work of saving and then investing could be, you know, eaten up by expenses. So thank you very much, and I think you made an excellent point. And before the break, I was going to talk about, um, I think, one of the first places that most individuals should invest their money in. First of all, I think that by putting money, if they have the ability to do so through their employer in their 401ks, 403bs, 457s, is a great place that will address the concern that you brought to the table. Uh, most employers out there have to act into a great extent as a fiduciary for their employees, meaning that they have to do things in their best interest and they have to have, for the most part, low expenses. But I think the most important part is I think that before we get caught into the specifics of expenses and so forth is the habit of saving. And if we take advantage of that through an employer where they have a company match also at the same time, which means that for every dollar that you invest, your employer may also contribute a percentage, right away that individual may be able to generate, if that employer is put in 25 cents in a dollar, to a 25% return, even if they put that money in a simple money market account. Now, I think you need to be a lot more specific and meet your goals, risk tolerance, time horizon, all the things that are critical in the investment process. But first and foremost, and I think you bring a good point, we need to make sure that we pay very close attention where we spend our money. Because even if we find the lowest expense mutual fund out there, but we don't have no money to save, what's the point? But thank you very much for bringing that that to, to the table. Do you have any other questions that you would like to have answered? Yeah, I think we lost Chloe. Okay. Um, you know, let me ask you a question. That raises a good point. Um, what are some of the most common mistakes that you tend to see from people who are maybe starting to do a financial plan or maybe have done it for a while and you look back and you're like, okay, they've done something wrong. Is there anything that's very common for those mistakes? Well, I think there's a couple different things that I see. First of all, the first thing I see is that a lot of people get intimidated, as I said before, by the word financial planning. That's the first thing that I think as a see as a mistake. The next thing that I see is people who start late in life. And as let's use an analogy of baseball since we're getting closer to summer. They are down six, seven runs and they're swinging for the fences for a home run when what we need is men on base. And in other words, we're trying to put the money to the most risky investment out there to try to make the best return that we can. Yet, at the same time, we're potentially don't understand what the risk is with that investment. And more importantly, we don't have an emergency fund in place, which what happens is this. As soon as something goes wrong in our lives, the first thing we do is we go to their 401k provider or we go to an IRA or a Roth IRA and we say, I need a loan or I need to withdraw the money. And I do understand that there are huge penalties and there are There's potentially I'm going to lose a lot of money for it. But, you know, the car broke down, and that's what forced me to get to work. So understanding the the pyramid structure in financial planning, which is have that emergency fund in place first, right? When we say we're going to save money for our retirement, the money is for our retirement. It's not for anything else other than that. Although I live in a real world where emergencies do happen. But if we have a well-structured emergency fund, which we can begin little by little, that helps us also at the same time with the ability to develop that savings mentality, which is critical. Just because the money is there doesn't mean that we need to spend it Mm -hmm. right? because it's for our future. Of course, we need to cover our current expenses. So I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that I see out there, Um, trying to swing for the fences from the beginning not having an emergency fund, and when you do begin to save, making that almost like an ATM. Yeah. And that's a mistake. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, you should have a separate fund for savings for current needs, and uh, the retirement fund should really just be for retirement. Correct. Julia. Pablo, I wanted to um, ask you a question. So we touched upon 401k place uh, savings plan at work if you have access to those. And the reality is that about 54% of New Jersey private sector 
workers do not have access to a 401k plan at work. Mm -hmm. um, and studies have shown that those who do are 15 times more likely to save if that's available to them. And that's actually one of the areas of work for AARP on advocacy and our work here to protect financial security is to allow access for all workers to have a, a place at work where they can save money. But for those workers who are listening on who don't have that as an option to them at work to be able to save away in a 401k plan, what are your suggestions for other avenues that they can look into to saving? So if we're talking about retirement, which is primarily where we started talking about, obviously you want to have something that is going to be tax advantage, meaning that is going to allow you to have this money grow on a tax deferred basis and most likely allow you to take a tax deduction. That, of course, will be most likely either an IRA, individual retirement account, which any individual, as long as they have earned income, they have the ability to be able to contribute into. Um, if those individuals want to take a tax deduction, which obviously today is tax day, for every dollar that they put in, they get to deduct against their, con their total earnings that they had for the year, which is a big, big advantage for them. Uh, of course, there are certain income limits we need to qualify that you may or may not be able to qualify to take a deduction. Of course, we live in that world that there's a qualifier for everything that we do. Uh, but that, to me, is the first place, I think, that if you don't have the ability to save through your employer, you need to take control of your own personal retirement savings on your own. An individual retirement account is a common word that almost everyone has been able to see. And you have many different uh, levels of risk. You can even open one at, at your local bank. You can open, if you feel that right now is not the time that you want to learn more about investments and you don't want to take any risk, well, go ahead and open one through a, a money market account or a CD at your local bank until you're able to get more self-familiarized. As the caller says, perhaps research the different investments, understand all the different expenditures that they have so more of your dollars are kept for you as compared to the company that is providing you the investment. But don't stop from doing this because you don't have all the answers. Most likely, you're never going to have all the answers to everything that you do. But you can rely on someone else to provide you with advice, plenty of information, websites like AARP.org that affords you the ability to get unbiased information about how to plan for your future. And that's what I love about working with AARP because the tools are there. We just need to get to the website, and the website will give us guidance on almost every subject as it relates to finances. Mm -hmm. Including calculators. Right? Absolutely, and, and that's the best part. So if you cannot afford to meet with a certified financial planner, and I know that that sometimes can be a, a difficult thing, ARP's calculators can afford you to create a basic financial plan to help you understand what it is that you need to save based on lifestyle. You can pick from the website also at the same time a basic guidance on how to create a budget. So, Julie, you could tell me probably off the top of your head right now what you pay for electric, what you pay for gas, what you pay for your rent, and what you pay for basic food. You can't tell me what you spend on gifts on an annual basis to all the people that you love and the people you have to buy gifts that you may not love. <laughs> <laughs> the times that you go and to take care of yourself, manicure yourself with it haircut, nails, all those things. And then, of course, all those impulsive purchases that you do. And you cannot tell me where that money goes. So what I think the website will show you is that to account for all those expenses, vacations, recreation, um, tolls, uh, maintenance, uh, your registration that you pay, in, those are all critical to understand. So the website will have that information for you. And then once you understand that where we began today about understanding your expenses, then you can plug that in and say, okay, this is the lifestyle I want to live. Let me put that into a calculator. Let me understand what I'm going to receive from Social Security. Let me understand what is my part, what is my responsibility to try to get me closer to the lifestyle that I want to live by having Social Security, maybe a pension for my employer if they still exist for you, and then what is my share that I need to save for the future? Critical. All of that available in one website. Those are all great tips. Absolutely. Excellent. 732-545-9282 uh, uh, is the number, 888-545-9282. Uh, and we will be back with Pablo Bianchi, Certified Financial Planner, again after the short break. The following alert is from the AARP Fraud Watch Network. 
Attention listeners, con artists are using sweepstakes, lotteries, and other contests to scam people out of thousands. They send official-looking prize notices or call to congratulate you, often claiming to work for the Federal Trade Commission or some other government agency. The scammers say that you have to pay a fee in order to collect your prize. They send you a check and tell you to deposit it and use the money to make a quick wire transfer to cover advance payment of taxes and fees. It all seems well and good until the check proves to be counterfeit, and that can take weeks. In the end, you're left liable for the money drawn from the deposit. So remember, no legitimate contest, sweepstakes, or lottery will ever ask for an advance fee to claim winnings. To learn how to protect yourself from scams like this and get local scam alerts from law enforcement, visit aarp.org slash fraudwatchnetwork. That's aarp.org slash fraudwatchnetwork. Paid for by AARP. Now, more sound advice on WCTC and WCTCAM.com. And we're back with your Life at 50 Plus presented by AARP. Uh, we're going to get on to uh, a topic which has four letter, uh, six letters, but I swear it's a four-letter word, and that's credit. But first, we're going to have uh, Dave Mullen, our state president, jump back on and get into the discussion. Dave, how are you? Hi, uh, Jeff. Uh, I just want to comment about uh, Pablo's advice. Uh, pa- Pablo and I have never met each other. Um, number one, um, I worked for a major company, and I had a very excellent pension program, and I wasn't too concerned. Uh, this new thing at the time, 401K, came out, and I think that was around 1987. Maybe uh, Pablo can correct me if I'm wrong that it became available then. And I went into it, uh, not as heavily as I could have, but I did go into it. And uh, I didn't pay a lot of attention to it. And about 10 years later, I looked down one day, and all of a sudden, there was all this money there, uh, which, believe me, uh, now in retirement, uh, has made my wife and me very, very happy. So the first point is that money can really mount up. And the second point, which I think your caller also commented on, and I can't stress enough because I didn't know anything about it when I retired. Um, When I retired, uh, my wife and I consulted a uh, certified financial planner like Pablo. It wasn't Pablo, but somebody else at the same job. And the first thing that he did was to look at the fees in my 401k. That was the first thing he did. And fortunately, as I expected, I worked for a very responsible company, and uh, the fees were very low. They were uh, subsidizing the fees, and that contributed a great deal uh, to this growth in my money that I discovered. So those are two things. One, get into these uh, tax-deferred retirement plans. Uh, try to forget about them. Uh, just put your money in and forget about it. And secondly, uh, when you do get involved in the investing, uh, the first thing you need to look at are the fee structures. Thank you for that comment, Dave. Um Pablo, credit. Now, credit scores, everyone thinks about in terms of uh, getting a car, getting good interest rates, getting a credit card. These are sort of today's needs for credit. But you made the point earlier off the air that, you know, having a good credit score it could really pay you off or having a bad one could really bite you in your retirement years. Yeah. And, and the truth is, as Dave just mentioned, you know, he looked down 10 years from the day that he started putting money into his 401k and boom then there is this big chunk of money well first of all if we go back to where we started in the savings and so forth that affords you the ability to save additional money well here's where credit can be a huge help to you when it comes down to saving and you may say well that doesn't make sense well let me explain (laughs) if you have an excellent credit then that means that you're paying a lesser interest rate when you're borrowing money. When you are then have paying less interest rate, that means you have more disposable income of your own that then you can appropriate towards the savings of your retirement. So now, this is a vicious cycle. Do you see how that works? If you're paying 19% on a credit card and that minimal payment is $150 a month, as compared to, let's say, a credit on some other form that you're paying 5%, and then the payment that you have to make for that is $100. That means you have an extra $50 of disposable income. That money can be allocated towards your retirement, which on top of it can possibly receive a match from your employer if you're working with one that has active match. So now that 50 may become 75. Now that's $75 on a monthly basis, 
which on an annual basis is eight hundred and forty dollars. So now we find ourselves in it. I'm sorry, uh, seven hundred and fifty plus one hundred, so it's nine hundred dollars. So now we find ourselves saving nine hundred dollars by simply having a good credit score. Right. And so, therefore, that nine hundred dollars compounded over ten, fifteen, twenty years can then afford us a better lifestyle because we pay less for what we borrow for, whether it is a car, a home, or whatever form of loans that we're paying for. So it is critical that we pay attention to our credit because that affords us choices. Again, I emphasize the letter S. And and oftentimes we say, well, I don't like that person, so I'm not going to pay that bill. Well, I hate to say this to you, but yet you may make that person angry, but you're making yourself in a putting yourself in a really bad situation because not only will that person be angry, but the rest of the world knows that you're not going to be responsible for paying them back. So as a result of it, you're going to pay a higher interest rate. Now, through 2008 and 2009, we saw a lot of people, unfortunately, face a tough circumstances with credit. And not because it was their choice. It's because they lost their jobs, because they found themselves in a difficult, difficult situation. Many people lost their homes. So today we have to worry about repairing our credit so it affords us the ability to be in a better situation. And more importantly, when we talk about credit today, I look at credit <clears throat> as a way through the services that they're available uh, www.freecreditreport.com that we can order our credit on an annual basis as a means to be able to check and protect our identity, which is another huge area that will affect our credit down the road because there's thousands of people across this country that wake up from one day to the next with items in their credit report that they have never themselves or their or spend their money. And that is a huge issue today. So credit being aware of how that can impact your future, understanding how it can help you protect your identity, and more importantly, take control of your savings for down the road is a critical factor in the financial planning process. And that and that's a very critical point you made there. One of the big areas for ARP too is protecting and being vigilant on your identity. And fraud watch is a major issue in the states. Uh, what is it? Every two seconds, somebody's identity gets stolen in the United States. So that's a very critical advice there on checking your credit. And you have offered in the past advice on what people can do. You have three reports that mm-hmm. you can look into annually. And I think you have a very great tip there for our, our listeners. Yeah, so check. it's not only about checking your report, Julie. It's also about checking and protecting your identity. So when you order your free credit report, you're entitled to receive all three credits. So what I normally do is they give you a choice when you do it online to order all, f- all three of them at the same time. Or you can spread them out throughout the year. So the one tip that I like to follow is to order, perhaps, perhaps let's begin with TransUnion first. And then four to five months down the road, order the Experian. Mm -hmm. That way you get to see what happened from, let's say, today, April, five months down the road in September. We get to see exactly if anything has happened. Now we have another one that we can order before year's end right, that it will still constitute the free credit report as compared to getting them all three at the same time and saying, oh, yeah, this looks great, this looks great. Now, waiting an extra year, how many bad things can happen in 365 days? A lot of things. Especially with credit. As you said, every two seconds, I don't know mathematically how many two seconds there are in 365 days, but there's quite a lot. Quite a lot, yes. I can say that for sure. And for somebody who's listening on who may be in a situation with their credit, there's some area for improvement there. Mm -hmm. Um, What are some quick tips or just some advice that you can offer for somebody as to some steps they could take now to look at where they stand and then some steps to improving? Well, so I, I think a big mistake a lot of people do when they take control of their lives when it comes to credit is that they tend to begin to cancel credit cards. And, you know, I believe that that is a great thing, but in the end, it may have a negative impact because once you terminate sometimes a credit card, it can impact your history, and that may be eliminated from your overall credit record. So overall, I think that it's not just sometimes saying, I'm going to wipe out all my credit and have no credit left, but also being smart about how it is that you manage your credit going forward. So the more important thing I want to say is, 
be smart about how you manage your credit because it can have an impact for your retirement. It can have an impact in an immediate basis. So you're not just committing to the long term. You're committing to the short term as well. Very we good. do live in a credit world. Julie, we have about one minute left. Really quick, give me those websites again that you said that AARP provides uh, for folks if they want more information. Absolutely. There's really great tools and resources that you can access online. Um, have a pen ready so you can list these down. So you can go to www.aarp.org slash order financial pubs to get some really great t- uh, tip sheets on financial security, as well as you can go to www.aarp.org slash money and also slash ready for retirement for some really great tips on how to better prepare yourself for your future. Thank you, Julie. Julie Marte, Associate State Director for Multicultural Outreach at AARP New Jersey. Paul Bianchi, Certified Financial Planner. Thank you both for joining us. I think we had a good discussion tonight, some really good information. We'll be back again next week with Your Life at 50 Plus, presented by AARP. Please join us then. Thank you.